Good morning and welcome to Armenino's webinar, The Shifting Spotlight, How PCAOB Inspection Results Impact SOX Compliance. I'm Mary Tressler. I want to welcome you on behalf of the firm. And just to let you know, you're looking at your webinar pane. Um, if you'd like to minimize it or maximize it, just click on the orange arrow in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. Um, feel free to submit any questions that you have throughout the duration of the webinar and our uh, presenters will answer those as time permits at the end. Um, also, please note that all webinar participants will get an email within the next 48 hours with a link to the slides and the recorded webinar and uh, your information about your CE certification. Okay, great. And if you um, are looking at your audio settings, make sure that you select the correct setting so that you do not get an echo. If you're using your telephone, click that button. Mic and speakers on your computer, click that one. Thanks. All right, and then to qualify for CE, you've got to make sure that you are using a personal computer and log in with your own information and unique URL. You need to be logged into our software for at least 50 consecutive minutes within the scheduled time frame of the webinar. Also actively respond to at least 75% of the polling questions and complete the evaluation survey at the end of the webinar, and then you will get your certificate. And with that, we'll move on to introducing our presenters. The first is Jeremy Suharski. He's a partner and leads the Armenino's um, Governance, Risk, and Compliance Practice. He's a proud graduate of Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. And uh, he brings over 13 years of experience building and managing teams that are focused on various internal control-related projects, including Sarbanes-Oxley readiness and compliance, process optimization, and business continuity. We also have Dave Davis, a consulting partner with our team, who's got 36 years of experience. He's done a lot of public company work and um, is a former CFO and COO. He's also worked for some large Fortune 500 companies such as Transamerica, ITEL, and Bank Austria. And our last presenter today is Sean Batchelor. He's a manager in our governance, risk, and compliance practice. And he's got six years of public accounting experience focused on SOX risk assessment, testing, and documentation. So you'll find all our presenters very well versed in the topic for today. All right, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dave Davis. Thank you, Mary. Some of our learning objectives for today. Uh, we'd like you to walk away today with a better understanding of the state of SOX compliance. SOX compliance continues to evolve, um, so this is going to be a key takeaway for today. And Keep in mind that it's likely to continue to evolve over time. Secondly, we're going to refresh your understanding of the PCAOB's current focus and what their uh, spotlight or uh, is uh, looking at and as a result of their inspection process findings. And last, we're going to uh, help enable implementation of COSO 2013. This is an effort that is going to be required by all public companies to implement in this current fiscal year. Okay. So as an overview of the presentation, we'll start with a state of the industry and, and talk a little bit about the evolving SOX landscape, the current focus of the PCAOB. Then we'll jump into some of the practice alert number 11 items. Uh, what are the primary points of focus of the PCAOB and what some of their findings have been from their inspections. And then the third item will be, uh, or the third section will be an updated uh, uh, on the COSO 2013 framework, what's changed, what's new. All right, and thanks for that introduction, Dave. Let's go ahead and get started here, really digging into the details. And for those that are on the line that have uh, interacted with me and know me, um, most people realize that at times I say I missed my calling and should have been a pilot. I'm uh, nuts about all things aviation. So, of course, I have to start with an aviation analogy. Um, for those of us in the Bay Area here, um, it, it was you know only about uh, six, eight months ago that um, Asiana Airlines crashed at SFO. And one of the things that came out in the wake of that um, were a lot of reports that had been issued previously and then refreshed in the wake of that accident that were issued by the FAA pointing out that the airline industry really was in crisis and pilots had become too dependent on, on autopilot within their aircraft and that's one of the, the reasons that they cited for, for the crash here at SFO. And to a certain degree, the, uh, the same argument could be made for the accounting industry. 
um, to be pointing out that in, in certain respects we have been on autopilot. Um, and by that I don't mean that we're overly dependent on automation, etc. Really what it is is this sense of complacency or this sense that what we did last year is going to be sufficient for this year and that our procedures, our processes, etc. do not need to evolve. I can't tell you how many discussions I've had with clients over the past 10 years um, where we've gone into an annual planning cycle and the comments have been, well, let's just do what we did last year. It worked last year, let's do it again this year. And I really think um, what we're going to be discussing today around the PCAOB's comments really call out that that is what's gotten us into a state where it really feels like we're starting over in some respects. And the challenges that we've worked through with clients over the past 6 to 12 months in some respects feel very similar to what we went through in 2004 when we were implementing SOX. Um, so what I'll challenge everyone with is to walk away from this, not only with a better understanding of, of SOX and how things are changing, but also to have a paradigm shift in your organization to say what we've done previously is no longer acceptable. It might be the right answer, but we're not going to accept it without thinking about it and uh, without going through the appropriate, uh, the appropriate process. And so as we think about this in more sharp relief as it relates to delivery of Sarbanes-Oxley services, one could, could look at a methodology and say, well, where in this methodology have we become complacent? Where is the, the autopilot? What you see here is Arminino SOX methodology, and it's going to look, feel, smell, et cetera, very similar to what a lot of other providers might do. You go through a risk assessment process, you plan a design, you deliver, you report, you optimize, and then a lot of the other components that, that um, flow throughout around change management KPIs and your quality assurance, et cetera. Now the challenge that we have in this space is really when you look at it, the mentality of year over year, clients only want you to do the same thing they had done previously, it really narrows this from five phases really down to one. And it really focuses on that centerpiece, which is the delivery. And in the Sarbanes-Oxley world, that's testing the effectiveness of controls. You always do the risk assessment. You always go through a planning process. There's always reporting and optimization, but those are really secondary. You know, it's the Pareto principle. It's the 20 compared to the 80%. Um, and the delivery really has become sort of the myopic focus. And what the PCAOB has challenged the industry with, specifically with Staff Alert 11, is that we're not doing enough. And we don't have enough risk assessment carrying through. We haven't done enough to validate that we have the right controls to test and that we've executed the testing procedures appropriately, et cetera. So as we continue the discussion today, we'll be talking about specifically how do we take a, a more holistic approach and how do we make sure that we are hitting each of these discrete areas with the appropriate level of effort and carrying it throughout the process. And so what does the evolving GRC landscape look like? You know, Dave, Dave mentioned that it's continuing to evolve, it's continuing to change. Well, really, if you back up, um, just about 10 years now, uh, AS2 was the first audit standard that we started working against. It was very much a bottom-up approach. Uh, we joke with, with some organizations that if you look at the number of controls that we had back in 2004, 2005, um, it was like if it moved, you put a control on it. In some cases, it was three, four, five hundred controls within an organization. It's way, too, way, way over controlled. Well, AS5 came out, and that really gave us a top-down approach. It really gave us the ability to look at entity-level controls and then work from the C-suite down. Um, companies went through an ongoing rationalization process. There was additional audit guidance issued in AS12, AS15, et cetera, around assessment of material misstatement, um, appropriateness of audit evidence, et cetera. And most recently, focus on management review control controls, completeness and accuracy considerations. A lot of these different things um, that ultimately organizations need to be thinking about. And this is going to continue to evolve and continue to change. And ultimately, where it brings us to, is, is a key message that we want you to walk away with. And, and I've touched on this already, and I really think it's summarized by what Grace Hopper said. She's a uh, U.S. Navy Rear Admiral. And she had a comment in a public speech that was, it's, uh, the, the most damaging phrase in the language is, it's always been done that way. And so we personally are challenging, uh, as Armenino, we're challenging all of our clients to think differently and to not accept the status quo without going through the appropriate planning process. Yeah. All right, well, uh, thanks for the introduction, Jeremy. It's a great state of the industry. Now we are going to get into the, the heart of this webinar, the PCAOB's shifting spotlight. So, so first thing I want to point out, it, it's important to note that what we cover today, it's not the product of new regulation or a new pronouncement or auditing standard, but rather a shifting spotlight, a shifting focus of the PCAOB resulting from recent inspections, specifically inspections over the past three years. 
So what specifically is, is driving this change, this shift of focus? Well, as Jeremy previously stated, last October, the PCAOB issued Staff Audit Practice Alert number 11. The Office of the Chief Auditor issued this practice alert in light of significant auditing practice issues observed by the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board, or the PCAOB, uh, relating to audits of uh, internal control over financial reporting, or ICFR. The General Inspection Report noted that the inspection staff found that 46 out of the 309 integrated audit engagements which were inspected did not have sufficient appropriate evidence to support the firm's internal control opinion. That's 15%. That's a very substantial figure. And of those 46, uh, of the integrated audit inspections that didn't have enough evidence to support the ICFR opinion, there were 39, which it was determined that the firm also failed to obtain sufficient appropriate evidence to support its overall opinion on the financial statements as a whole. On this slide, we have also included a few other statistics, uh, which are quite interesting and illustrate why there is a shift to this focus. I already mentioned the 15% uh, the figure. Um, turning your attention to the middle chart, you'll see that 16% of ICFR audits had unreported or unidentified deficiencies. That's a pretty scary figure. And to the right of that, 70% uh, of ICFR opinions were issued with control deficiencies. The staff alert identifies several areas with the greatest issues according to the recent inspections. First off, assessing the risk of, mater of material misstatement. The alert discusses the process of assessing risks for components of significant accounts and disclosures as well as considering risk in determining the scope of testing in multi-location engagements, which is becoming more and more common with our shrinking global business environment. The next topic, selecting controls to test. The alert discusses the requirements for selecting controls to test and considerations for making an appropriate selection of controls to test, including controls that operate infrequently, such as annual or as-needed type of controls, where there may only be one or a small handful of occurrences throughout the year. Next. Testing Management Review Controls, or MRCs as they're more commonly referred to. The alert discusses management review controls and stresses the, the specific requirements in PCAOB standards for testing those controls. IT considerations, including that of system-generated reports. Jeremy will be covering this topic. The alert highlights requirements in PCOB standards regarding the consideration of IT and audits of internal control, including testing controls that use system-generated data and evaluating deficiencies within IT general controls, or ITGCs. Next, roll forward of controls tested at an interim date. The alert discusses the auditor's responsibilities when controls are tested at an interim date, including the necessary roll forward procedures to extend those results through year end. And lastly, analysis of control failures. The alert discusses the auditor's responsibilities for evaluating control deficiencies, and highlights the importance of testing compensating controls and performing the evaluation with professional skepticism and careful analysis. We will discuss each of these in more detail in the following slides. But first, we've come to our first polling question. All right, so get ready to share your answers with us. And the first polling question is, have you read PCAOB's Staff Audit Practice Alert number 11? It's yes or no? So we'll give uh, the group a chance to um, answer so you make sure that you get your continuing education credits. So make sure you put in your selection there and we will close the poll in uh, five seconds here. So five, four, three, two, one. All right, and we'll share the results of your poll. Are you surprised? Um, I am I am not surprised in the least. Uh, this doesn't surprise me. So really, um, it, it's not surprising that no one uh, on the webinar today has read this. That being said, um, I, I, it, the reason it doesn't surprise me is most organizations look to their service providers, such as Armenino, to really be giving them the updates, et cetera, um, specific to uh, internal controls uh, and, and ICFR considerations. So definitely does not surprise me, but um, hopefully those uh, of you on the call will walk away from this, not only with some knowledge, but also with the impetus to go pull that uh, that standard down and uh, and read through it. There's a lot of very good information there. Great. Okay. Next, we're moving on to assessing risk of material misstatement. Thank you, Mary. 
Uh, so what, what we're going to talk about here for a few minutes uh, is an important and uh, underlying concept in, in the entire approach to evaluating internal controls. Risk assessment is the initial key element uh, of a top-down approach. And it really underlies the entire process in the audit of internal control. And I say that from both the management perspective as well as the external auditor uh, perspective. Each one has to do their own uh, assessment of the total risk profile for the company and drill down to the specific areas that present uh, the most risk to the to the misstatement of the financial statements. So, have you as a company identified all the risks of material misstatement? Have you evaluated the types of potential misstatements that occur or could occur in your environment? What are the likely sources of those potential misstatements? And frankly, it's necessary for management to select appropriate controls to test based on that. You want to be testing the controls that have the highest level of risk that you might have a material misstatement in your financial statements. Let me give you an example. If management identifies revenue overstatement as a risk, for whatever reason, without assessing how those overstatements might occur and or understanding the controls in place to address those risks, you'll lack a basis to make an informed selection of the controls that you will test. So you lay claim to the, uh, to the fact that you want to test certain controls, but if you don't do a good job of documenting why there could be a material misstatement and what are the reasons for that, and thus these controls are important to test because they would identify those things, then you're not really doing uh, the proper job on the risk assessment. Uh, the last point we'll make here is to discuss walkthroughs. This is a, a great way to uh, validate and assess your assessment of the risk by understanding the underlying processes better. Um, I might point out that the general inspection report from the PCA will be noted that in some situations, Walkthrough procedures were not adequate to verify the understanding of the risks in the company's process. Now, they're primarily looking at, when they're doing the inspection, the external auditors uh, work on walkthroughs. But I can guarantee you, if the external auditors aren't doing a very good job on walkthroughs, uh, management probably isn't either, at least. That has been the pattern we have seen in the work we have done with clients, that if the client, if the management isn't doing a good job on walkthroughs and making sure they're identifying the risks as they're walking through the process, as opposed to just understanding, yes, we have a control here uh, as, as part of the process. What's the risk it's mitigating? Is it mitigating all the risks that of, in the example I gave, of overstatement? Uh, then you're not doing the job as management. And one thing to, to just to point out and reinforce, Dave, as well is, I think a key takeaway on this is that the risk assessment is not a point-in-time activity. And I think that's really one of the things PCAOB was highlighting was it's commonly been viewed as a point-in-time activity. You do it at the beginning of the process as planning to validate some of your assumptions, and then it gets kind of round-filed and revisited in the following year. Really, the risk assessment has to be something that carries through all aspects of the project. It has to carry through to your walkthroughs. It has to carry through to your testing, to your remediation, et cetera. And if you're not, then really you're not meeting the requirements um, as they are laid out. So something really to keep in mind. Yeah, I would agree with that, Jeremy. And to just to make that point a little clearer, during the course of a given year, most companies evolve dramatically, um, either from a process standpoint, a people standpoint, systems, technology, acquisitions. All of those um, events should lead you back to a reassessment of your risk assessment. Yep. Absolutely. So let's then shift gears slightly and let's talk about updating controls and really taking a hard look at what controls should be included. So um, this ultimately becomes a tug of war and the first question that you need to ask is, are optimization and rationalization the same? And We did make this a polling question so we can't see what folks think, but um, the answer is that they're not and they commonly get, uh, get misinterpreted or viewed as the same thing. And ultimately, 
rationalization is a process that really occurred in, in large uh, amounts as we moved from AS2 to AS5, and that is really thinning down your control set, determining if you have too many controls, uh, far broader of a control set, if you will, um, and don't need that many. So as we went from a bottom-up approach, as we described to a top-down approach, we really went through a significant rationalization perspective to reach this point of e equilibrium with the total number of controls. Most companies, depending on the, the level of risk, depending, depending on the nature of the organization, are going to have somewhere in the range of 100, 120 controls, give or take. Um, that's commonly where we balance. That's really about as thin as you can trim. Um, of course, that is, you know, uh, unique to every company. Some may have more, some may have less, if you have unique divisions, etc. But if you were to look across the, the, the base of clients we work with, that's commonly the equalization point. Now where optimization comes in, it's a matter of not going wider with your controls. It's a matter of going deeper with your existing controls. And that's really where the PCAOB has been highly, uh, highly critical, um, especially in Staff Alert 11, of how organizations have optimized their controls. Um, and it's getting into things like validation of source data, management review comments, et cetera, or excuse me, management review controls. And we're going to speak to those individually here as we go forward. But the idea that people need to take away with them is that the process of reevaluating and selecting which controls to test, number one, is driven by the risk assessment process. So if you've identified risks that are material to your organization or have the ability to result in a material misstatement, you need a control that's in place to mitigate that risk to an acceptable level. If you have an, in a, a relevant account on the balance sheet or P&L um, and there are financial statement assertions tied to that and there are internal control assertions tied to that that have risks associated, you need to have controls in place. And then from there, determining if the control is designed appropriately and goes to the right level of detail is really where optimization comes in. And it is an exercise that needs to be looked at on an ongoing basis. And so with that, let's shift gears and let's dig into one of the key areas of optimization, and it's in the form of management review controls. Thanks, Jeremy. Yeah, so now we're going to turn our attention to MRCs. So you might be asking yourself... So we have a polling question here to launch first. Oh, we do. We do. All right. So here's the question. Has your organization identified specific MRCs as a subset of your key controls? So please go ahead and weigh in with your responses. Again, we want to make sure that you get your credit for your continuing education and your participation in these polls is necessary. Great, okay, we've got about 80% of you who have voted. We will close the poll in uh, five seconds. Okay, thank you, so let's share the results. Okay, so Jeremy, are you surprised by the answers on this one? I will say I am surprised. Um, I'm impressed that 70% of companies have identified MRCs um, and specifically called those out. Um, most organizations have not gone through that process or have not gone through it at the adequate level of detail. So and those that are unsure, um, also not necessarily surprising. So um, Dave, what are your thoughts? Um, and Sean, you guys as well. Yeah, I'm a little surprised too that it's that high. But that's good. And I'm going to compliment the audience for uh, doing that effort. Obviously, that uh, will lead to a better result in their SOX compliance for fiscal uh, 2014 if they've already done that work. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so let's start, turn it back to Sean and, and let him uh, pick up where we left off. <laughs> sure thing. So I, I'm pleased to see with the response to the polling question, it seems like a, a good majority of you are at least aware or have heard of management review controls. Um, for those of you that have not, well, there really is no specific absolute definition per se. There is some judgment involved when determining which controls are deemed MRCs. But MRCs typically involve comparing recorded financial statement amounts to expected amounts and investigating significant differences from these expectations. The key word here is expectations. It is important the reviewer has expectations leading into the review as opposed to going into the review blind. The logic is that without expectations, it's very difficult to identify outliers. All right, so in the past, it may have been suitable for review to simply be evidenced by a signature, a check the box approach. This really no longer flies. There needs to be evidence of consideration of expectations and outliers. A real-world example from one of my clients 
And a real world example of an MRC that is present for most manufacturers is the review of the E&O reserve calc. It is not enough for a reviewer to look at the calculation, observe that the amount is consistent with prior periods, spot check a few formulas and sign off. The reviewer should consider information obtained from other outside sources other than the preparer of the calculation. Were there any discussions of specific quality issues with key inventory items during the recent monthly sales ops meeting? This would create an expectation for the reviewer that the E&O reserve should increase and the inventory items discussed in the sales op meeting would be expected to be included in the E&O reserve analysis. For this particular client, this particular example, we referenced in our testing support the handwritten notes the reviewer of the E&O reserve had from the sales ops meeting he attended. We were able to point to those notes as evidence of reviewer expectations leading into the review of the E&O calc. And I think the, th the, the key thing here, Sean, um, that we want to highlight, and we're going to go into more detail here as, as folks can see on the screen, but it's really a matter of making sure that you don't make assumptions. Um, to the point that you made, we had to go back and pull handwritten notes. Thank goodness the controller that we worked with at this specific organization you're citing keeps detailed notes. Um, because it was, just, it was assumed that that data, while it's relevant to the operations of the company, was not uh, something that needed to be retained as audit evidence. So uh, don't assume that something that you're doing is not uh, potentially going to be called into question or called into to be audit evidence as part of uh, an MRC being executed. Absolutely, that's a great point. So as we've been hitting on, in today's environment, organizations must seek to understand, first off, the intent of the review. What risk is management hoping to mitigate? Is it understatement of the e and reserve, like our example perhaps? Number two, the mechanics of the review. What data is obtained? Uh, how does the control owner know it's complete and accurate? How do they interact with the data? What, what columns in the reports are actually used and relevant? Next, precision. What is the dollar level threshold? What is the, the percentage threshold that would raise a red flag? What are the thresholds for outliers and expectations? These, these thresholds need to be uh, clearly stated, if, if not in the control activity description itself, then somewhere you know, in your uh, risk assessment area. And lastly, objectivity of the person performing the review. Are they qualified? Do they have the right skill set to perform the operation of the control? So now, you, now that you know what the, uh, the review process should be in management review controls, I should also point out that there's actually three different levels or three different categories of, of MRCs. The first is MRC category one. The degree of judgment involved in execution of the control is low in MRCs in this category. The control is generally found within the process as opposed to being a control that monitors the effectiveness of other controls. So that's kind of the lowest level MRC. Next, MRC category two, well as you'd expect, this is kind of the middle ground. If it doesn't fit in category one or three, this is where they stick it. The controls here, the degree of judgment involved in the execution of the control is other than low. Con the control is designed to monitor the effectiveness of other controls or may be intended to reduce or eliminate testing and reliance on process level controls or ITGCs. And finally, MRC category three. This is kind of the heavy hitter. Um, the degree of judgment involved in the execution of the control is significant. These are controls where, um, you know, a lot of, there has to be a lot of judgment involved. The control associated with the relevant assertion, it requires a lot of judgment. So in our example, the E&O reserve calc, well, this would definitely be an MRC category three. So, Sean, a question for you. Uh, should companies be documenting these at this level of precision in, uh, in, in their documentation for SOCs? Yeah, they, they definitely should. But what I would recommend is, is reaching out first to their externals. We've had some clients where it's actually the external auditors that have uh, decided which controls are, in fact, MRCs and the subsequent classification of those controls. Okay. And uh, one other thing I just wanted to point out as well is we touched on objectivity, but this is really one that, that needs to have a, a critical eye, not just on the precision mechanics and intent, but the objectivity really plays in. And a perfect example is one of the organizations that we work with, the CFO is very investor focused. Um, he's, he's doing a lot of IR activities, et cetera. And really a lot of the core accounting functions are, are, um, are delegated to the, the chief accounting officer. So if you're looking at a very complex, very judgmental calculation like an E&O reserve or an absorption calculation, the CFO really wouldn't be the right person to do, be doing that review while the individual is capable and qualified. He's further removed from the details. So really the appropriate individual to be doing that review and signing off on it ultimately is a chief accounting officer and potentially even someone lower in the process, for example, a cost accounting manager. 
So objectivity really forces you to take a look at your organization and determine have we assigned the roles and responsibilities for these key MRCs to the right people. And in most cases, we're seeing organizations have to come back and sort of shuffle the deck and reassign some of these reviews to make sure that you really have the right person who is closest to the details doing that actual review. Absolutely, that's a great point. So now you might be asking yourself, well, how do you tackle MRCs? First, what we recommend is, is review your existing controls and determine which you are defining as MRCs. And as I mentioned, it may be a good idea to discuss this selection with your external auditors as we have seen in some engagements, the externals have defined which controls are in fact MRCs. Once you have defined your population, bolster your evidence. Circling back to our ENO reserve example, include with the evidence the meeting agenda, the minutes, or even your own handwritten notes from the sales ops meeting discussing the parts with recent quality issues. This is a great way to show you, as a reviewer, as a reviewer had expectations leading into your review, which better enables you to be on the lookout for outliers, which may warrant attention. The last thing you want to do here is assume all is well and amounts are you know, in line with past. Don't be on autopilot. Good point, Sean. Another question. Uh, should companies be looking at their controls, especially complex controls and high-risk areas like inventory and reserves, et cetera, and potentially breaking the control down into separate steps that are done by different people within the organization so that the reviewers can, you can have a better or a more effective review process? Yeah, absolutely right. I mean, anytime you can really have, you know, um, other hands in the pot, you're going to see different takes from different points of view. It's not just a finance focus, you know, review. And like I mentioned in our example, you know, you're getting input from people in sales, from operations, et cetera. So it, it, it's nice to expand your, your view, and that will help you, like I said, identify the outliers. That's great. Thank you. And way to have another uh, airline analogy, too. Thank you. Yeah, I thought you'd like I, that. I appreciate that. <laughs> you get extra points. Absolutely. What kind of plane was that that we saw earlier? Uh, I'm guessing it's either a 777 or, um, or potentially a 67. It's a glass cockpit, so it's newer, and it had, uh, did not have a side stick, so it's not an Airbus. But uh, I could go on and on, as I'm sure you know, Dave. So. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Geek. <laughs> Thank you. So let's shift gears here, and let's talk a little bit about IT considerations around system-generated reports. And to do that, Let's kick off with our next polling question. Okay, so we've got a true-false for you here. So IT involvement is necessary when evaluating system-generated reports for completeness and accuracy. So do we have to have IT involved? Are you not sure? Let us know your thoughts on that. Hey boy, you guys are voting fast today, so we'll close the poll in uh, just a couple of seconds. All right, great. Let's share the results. All right, and the results as they come up here on the screen. Um, the correct answer is true, um, and I will caveat that with there, there might be the unique occasion um, very seldom where IT would not to be, need to be involved, and that potentially is if somebody within the accounting function themselves themselves has the, the detailed expertise to, to perform the validation steps. But in 99% of the cases, the answer is going to be true. And ultimately, you do need to engage an IT professional to assist with the validation. So um, let's dig in and let's talk about specifically what that is. And uh, just as a bonus question for anybody on the line, if you can tell me what's missing from that, that code string there, um, you, you win the grand prize. Um, so go ahead and use your uh, question panel. Go ahead and type the answer in. Exactly. exactly. Jeremy's going to get you a brand new airplane. Exactly. <laughs> Potentially a Boeing. Um, system generated reports, this is something that was explicitly called out within, uh, within Staff Alert 11. And the key thing that it asked is, how do you know in the performance of a control that the report you're leveraging has inherent completeness and accuracy? What have you done in the performance of that control to verify it's complete and accurate? Now, this is not a new and unique issue. It's something that's come up over the years. It's been in the spotlight. It's fallen out of favor. It's come back several times. So it is something that is, is not unique to Sarbanes-Oxley compliance. What is unique is the way in which that needs to be approached. In the past, it was sufficient for the, uh, the internal provider, um, so the, whoever was in charge of the Sarbanes-Oxley compliance activities within the organization, to substantively, meaning as of a point in time, validate the completeness and accuracy of the reports. 
what changes with the issuance of Staff Alert 11 is it is no longer acceptable to substantively validate that the reports are complete and accurate, especially having the internal provider do that. Instead, what needs to be done is really a three-step process. And it has to be, uh, and what the paradigm shift has to happen is the control owner specifically has to be validating completeness and accuracy in the uh, execution of that specific control. Let me explain what that means. The piece where IT needs to be involved is really the first step. It's validating that the report that is being used actually has the proper data. So it's engaging with the, the user of that report, understanding the purpose of the report, understanding what uh, the key fields and the key data that is contained in that report is being used for. They then need to dig into the back end of it, dig into the SQL statements, dig into the stored procedures, dig into all of the code that is being uh, generated to, that is being used to generate that report and provide the assurance back to the control owner that yes, this is actually achieving what it is that you are intending it to do. And the reason this is important is not so much that you have fraudulent activities occurring and you have individuals intentionally omitting something. It's more around the occurrence or more likely that you're going to have the occurrence that something is inadvertently omitted. Um, and for, for example, one organization that we work with, uh, they had a report that had hard-coded um, account ranges in there. Well, as your chart of accounts evolves, that report is inadvertently omitting accounts that should be potentially included in that analysis. And that was ultimately flushed out of this process. So that's where the IT involvement comes in. Then you look at how the control owner interacts with that report, and that's the second step to the process. So if you take a report, pull it out of your ERP system, and you've worked with your IT organization, you've got inherent assurance that it's complete and accurate, well, now you stick it into a spreadsheet and apply some other logic to it. Well, now all of your completeness and accuracy considerations go out the window to a certain degree because you've got a report that has been verified as being complete, and now you're putting it into an end-user tool such as Excel. So you as the control owner then need to document what you did to verify completeness and accuracy. So a piece of it can be um, having uh, screenshots to show the input of data that you passed that report, for example, a date range, an account range, etc. And then showing that you've done some type of procedure, and it can be as straightforward as ticking in time, showing that the data that comes out of that report and made its way into the spreadsheet does in fact tie. So it's a relatively straightforward piece of how the process would work, but the key thing here is having auditable evidence that comes out of it. Now the third piece, because I said it's, it's a three-step approach, you've got IT, you've got what the control owner does, the last piece is the validation of it, and that's where internal audit or the SOX provider would come through and validate that these pieces, the first two pieces, ultimately fit together and have the appropriate level of documentation, et cetera. Um, so that's really the key thing here that they were pointing out um, in Staff Alert 11 is this strong need to be looking critically at your reports and verifying that they do in fact have the, uh, the appropriate uh, completeness and accuracy. The other caveat here is if that report is coming off of a system that is not uh, in scope for IT general controls, um, there need to be additional procedures performed by the provider, both internal and external, to gain some additional comfort that the, re the report in fact does have completeness and accuracy nailed because um, if you don't have the appropriate ITGCs over that, that environment, uh, we have not validated complete, We have not validated the uh, security, granting of access, terminating of access. We have not verified change in, change control, operations, etc. A lot of considerations that would go into that. So it really is not only isolated to the report, but the underlying systems as well. All right, let's move on to something that doesn't look so much like Greek. <laughs> uh, let's talk a little bit about roll forward of controls tested at an interim date. So let's make the assumption that you've done a good job selecting your controls to test based on your risk assessment work and your understanding of the risks that your controls are trying to mitigate and that you've selected a good plan for your initial round of testing. So which controls should you test at that interim date? As we talked about a little earlier, there's a there's a lot of work that needs to go into that in evaluating what controls should be tested. Um, some, some points to keep in mind is that the PCAOB's general inspection reports have noted and have identified instances where significant controls tested at an interim date uh, and the, they weren't tested properly or they used inquiry alone so that the interim testing may not have been uh, as robust as it should have been. 
thus putting more uh, risk at the control testing in the future not being effective either. So keep that in mind that you need to really think about why am I testing these controls and how am I testing them so that you can have enough evidence that the uh, controls were operating effectively. Okay? Now, although uh, auditors express an opinion on the internal controls that as of the end of the year, you have to keep in mind that you should be testing and they will also be testing important controls both earlier in the year and at the end of the year simply because they need they need to understand for the integrated audit did that control operate all year even though the audit opinion on internal controls is only as an as of date for their integrated audit they need to better understand how that all rolled together throughout the year and were those controls effective throughout the period so that they can determine the extent of their substantive testing. Uh, a couple other things. Uh, management needs to keep in mind when selecting and testing uh, and developing the controls is that Audit Standard 5 provided that inquiry may be sufficient for roll forward procedures. Um, but really, they were looking at the lower risk controls, um, not the higher risk controls. So you want to definitely make sure you have done a good job up front determining whether or not that control is uh, low risk high or high risk, and uh, designing your control testing to be effective in that way. Um, so, uh, and, and the other thing to keep in mind is that the more complex or subjective a control is. So management review controls, for example, where there's a lot of uh, assumptions that go into it, a lot of knowledge that uh, you may have built up over the year uh, that help you evaluate that control. Those can more complex controls, uh, you really need to do more than uh, inquiry only at year end. You need to roll those forward and test them uh, pretty thoroughly so that you can get a good assessment from a management perspective uh, as well as the external auditors uh, helping uh, if you're using a service provider or internal audit uh, they will be relying on some of that work so if you want to keep the work that the external auditors are going to do down to a minimum you need to do a good job of the management testing through your internal audit or a service provider so that there can be reliance on that so um, the last thing I would say in this is have a discussion with your external auditors about your testing plan, what you're going to do. See if it's going to stand up to what they're looking for. See if it's going to have enough documentation uh, for them to be able to rely on it. Uh, because they're being held to a much higher standard today by the PCAOB than they have ever been. So they are going to be coming back to you as management and saying, you need to do a better job as well, or they're going to have to do it uh, on top of what you've done. All right, let's look at, uh, let's talk a little bit about analysis of control failures. Which, in our client base, everybody is sparkling and awesome, so we don't have control failures. But in the event that you do, <laughs> we need to make sure we go through the process to analyze them correctly. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, from a high level, uh, you have to keep in mind this uh, um, sufficiency of the exception evaluation, consideration of all relevant risk factors, the level of precision the control operated at, and um, you have to evaluate the deficiency in isolation and combination. So let's dig a little deeper on it because, frankly, this is no longer a check-the-box thing on evaluation of the deficiency. Uh, you need to do a deep analysis of the financial impact and what caused it. So if we skip to the next, next slide, we'll see that we have a little bit of an uh, analysis approach uh, laid out here where we start with the root cause. So what caused the exception? You've got to know that. You have to understand it, what caused it, document it in your analysis work papers. And um, Dave, let me jump in here on the root cause, too, because we could spend an entire webinar just talking about how to properly do root cause analysis, and it's really, really big in, 
not only in ISO, but if you look at, you know, Six Sigma and lean sure. manufacturing, very, very big. I think the key thing to take away from those types of methodologies for root cause is you start by looking at what the potential causes are. And really it's a brainstorming exercise. Um, and it's going through and saying, well, what could it have been? It's not just one single thing, but it, it, it could have been a multitude of things, et cetera. And then drill down on what is that one single thing, if there is one single thing that ultimately drove to that. Yeah. And so as a, um, as a helping hint here, look at and figure out what caused the exception, what aspect of the control failed. Uh, it may not have been the entire control. It may have been part of the control. What was, was the design of the control appropriate? Evaluate that um, for two purposes. One, for the analysis of the magnitude of this issue, uh, and also whether or not you need to change the design going forward. Was there human error involved in it? So is there a training issue that needs to be uh, dealt with? Um, and Or was management review lacking or ineffective in this? Uh, was the control executed at the right level, the right precision, but management just did a poor job of follow-up uh, and review, and um, that can cause the problem. So the next thing that we want to talk about here is potential magnitude. So what are the assumptions um, that have been used to scope the magnitude? Once you've come up with this, the magnitude of this is a million dollars, you know, what were your assumptions in that? And you should be starting with what's the total potential impact and then whittling down from there based on your analysis. So also you want to document whether or not the assumptions that went into determining the magnitude are reasonable. So challenge yourself. Was that a reasonable assumption or did I take just a shortcut to get through this process? Uh, I know this is a painful process. It's always done at the end of the uh, it seems like when you're trying to file your 10K, it's when you're trying to analyze these things. Um, but you have to do the proper and thorough analysis. Um, so then we go to, uh, from, from there, still in the potential magnitude, you have to evaluate each exception individually first. And then you have to look at all of your exceptions and determine whether any of them are grouped together and, and in impacting or supposed to be impacting and covering the same risks. Uh, if they are, then you have to aggregate them and put them together and evaluate, okay, individually these may be control exceptions um, or deficiencies, but when I put all of them together, say there's three deficiencies, was the likelihood that the failure of all three of those give rise to a significant deficiency or a material weakness. So that is the evaluation uh, that you have to think about. And then once you've scoped that all out and figured out where you are, then you can start looking at, do I have compensating controls? And did they effectively operate? Uh, did they address the same risks that the failed control did? And if they did and they operated effectively, it's possible that at the level of precision they operated, they may have mitigate, they would have mitigated any material weakness that would have flowed through to the financial statements. And the last point I want, want to make here is once you come to your conclusion, go back to your root cause and walk through the documentation you've created on this and make sure you have literally written the book on what caused it, what the potential magnitude was, I evaluated it based individually and in aggregate compensating controls. Make sure you've done a good job of documenting this. This isn't something that should be uh, a check the box. As I said before, there shouldn't be just a couple of comments and conclusion. This needs to be a thorough, well-written analysis that somebody can pick up, i.e. the external auditors or the PCAOB, uh, and say, I understand what happened. I understand why it wasn't a material weakness, and I understand what compensating controls, if there were any, are in place, and what's the conclusion, uh, and, and come to the same conclusion you did. Because remember, you have a lot of knowledge when you're going through this process, 
uh, that other people wouldn't have the benefit of because they don't work there every day. So you need to impart that knowledge into your documentation. And I think the key thing too, building on that, Dave, is is really one of the things that the Staff Alert 11 was going after here as well is it's not only, so number one, yes, you're absolutely right. You need to have a more robust documentation process. You need to go through the proper analysis process. And this is one of those things that honestly we just, we mean in the industry, kind of blasted through. And I think that's why it was called out in sharp relief in the report. But it's also having this mindset of not what, not what did happen, but what could have happened. So in the past, you would substantively go in and say, well, we had this issue, but it was an isolated event. You know, we, you know, we had two POs that weren't approved. It's a deficiency. Well, we've substantively validated every other PO was properly approved. Well, it's not a matter of what did happen. It's a matter of what could happen. And that's really the key thing that also plays into this is not just the, the process you go through, but the mindset you have. Good points, Jeremy. So let's shift gears and let's touch briefly on the COSO uh, framework. And with that, I think we're going to begin with our next polling question. And this is the last one of the day, so please weigh in here. How many principles are cited in the updated COSO 2013 framework? Wait, nothing. You're really giving them a tr trick question there, Jeremy. <laughs> uh, this wasn't me. This was Sean. <laughs> okay. So if you've done your homework, then you'll know the answer. Um, so great, we've got the majority of you voting. We'll close the poll in just a couple of seconds here. And if you don't know the answer, you can just take a guess. All right, we're going to go ahead and close the poll and share the results. So, Sean, how many people were correct? Wow, it looks like 75% uh, of you out there were correct. I'm glad to see that. So... So for those of you who didn't get that correct, um, you know, as you, as you may or may not have heard, there was a recent update to the COSO framework, which was published in May of 2013. The original framework was published in 1992, over 20 years ago, so you can see that there's definitely time for refresher. The, trans the transition period from old COSO to new COSO has been defined as May 14, 2013 to December 15, 2014. After December 15th of this year, Old COSO is considered superseded by the 2013 edition. The COSO board believes organizations reporting externally should clearly disclose which framework is being utilized. The COSO board encourages moving to the new framework as soon as feasible. You can see on the slide here that the, uh, the new updated framework, along with the executive summary, it's a whopping 500 pages. Um, I do highly recommend at least uh, skimming through the executive summary, though. You can see here the two different COSO cubes, the original cube and the updated one. They look pretty similar. You can see that the three categories, which are depicted on the top of the cube, those are the same. And the five components also have not changed, and those are depicted on the front of the cube. So what has changed? Well, as you'd expect, a lot has changed in 20 years within the environment in which companies operate and do business. The world is a different place now with new considerations and challenges. The 2013 COSO update reflects the increased relevance of technology. Think about how technology has progressed. There were no SaaS companies 20 years ago. The update considers different business models and organizational structures. It enhances governance concepts by placing a larger emphasis on entity level controls and tone at the top. The update clarifies requirements for effective controls and it applies a principles uh, based approach and you know as you saw in our poll there is 17 principles supporting the five components of internal control. So what has not changed? Well, the core definition of internal control, that has not changed. That is still the same. And as I mentioned, the three categories and uh, objectives are also the same, and also the five components. I would say arguably the, the change with the largest impact is likely to be the consideration of the 17 principles. The updated framework sets out 17 principles representing the fundamental concepts associated with each component. Because these principles are drawn directly from the components, an entity can achieve effective internal control by applying all 17 principles. It should be noted that each principle is suitable to all entities. All principles are presumed relevant except in rare, and I stress very rare, situations where management determines that a principle is not relevant to a component. The framework sets forth the requirements for an effective system of internal control, and this mandates that each of the five components and the related principles are present and functioning. 
So on this next slide, I apologize, I know it's a bit of an eye test. Uh, we don't expect you to be able to uh, necessarily read the top there, but take my word for it, the, row, or the columns rather, they represent the 17 principles. So, so one way we've aided clients in ensuring that all 17 principles are considered is we have baked the 17 principles by component into the internal control matrices, or ICMs. This allows for easy mapping on an individual control level to the principles and will allow you to see if any principles have not been considered or are not covered by a control. So as I mentioned, the columns here represent the 17 principles. Horizontally, the rows would represent individual key controls within a given cycle. You will find, uh, let's see here, you will find that if there is a gap and you need to design a new control to address a principle, the updated framework includes 75 points of focus to help aid in the control design, but please note that every point of focus does not need to be uh, in existence for effective internal control. We recommend developing and executing on a transition plan, assign a single owner or project manager, evaluate the components of your internal system, and compare to COSO. Identify gaps in the control environment and design and implement controls to address those gaps. As a reminder, after December 15, 2014, Old COSO is considered superseded by 2013 edition. Now is a good time to start developing a transition plan. And thanks for that update, Sean. It was very, very good. And for those on the, the webinar, if you need or would like some additional input on COSO, please either type it into your, your question pane or feel free to email us. You'll have our contact uh, info at the end. We did a previous session, a uh, one-hour session on COSA, where we really go into even more detail, and we're happy to uh, provide that content to you as well. So let's talk briefly then about um, kind of what, what's next and what's coming. We'll peer into the crystal ball. We'll shake the magic eight ball. We'll look at the tea leaves, whatever analogy you want to use. Um, and really, I want to highlight two of these. Um, you know, one of the things I think that's been drastically underused um, that, that was part of the original Sarbanes-Oxley Act was mandatory jail time for uh, CFOs, CEOs, knowingly and willingly committing fraud. And it's really been underused, um, has not been used in a lot of prosecutions. As we have this additional focus on internal controls and internal control optimization, I do believe that's something that we're going to start to see more of. And the other one I want to highlight as well, just briefly, is I also think that we're going to start to see more focus on fraud controls. If you look at some of the fraud surveys that are conducted annually, um, it, it highlights that um, some of the estimates around annual losses due to fraud can be as high as $700 billion. So if you think about that, if, we're, if, if industry is losing $700 billion through fraud, obviously there's something wrong with that control environment, and it's not detecting and preventing fraud at the appropriate level. So I do think that's something we're going to continue to see um, an additional focus on. And you can see the other ones here, ongoing optimization, integration with IT, et cetera. Those are things that we've really been hitting on throughout the, uh, throughout the session today. And while we've been working um, on a lot of these topics uh, today, we've been trying to provide relevant, tangible things you can take away and put into, uh, into practice at your organization. And really, how you can be ready is, first and foremost, it's a planning exercise. Start it early. Get all of the appropriate individuals to the table within the organization. If you're using an external provider, um, get your external provider uh, for your internal controls to the table and get your external auditor to the table as well and have a planning session. As necessary, revise your methodology and make sure that if you have four, five, six different phases of that methodology, make sure that each one carries the appropriate weight and it's not an activity where you ultimately round file the result. Make sure you're having discussion with your management, with auditors, et cetera, and revisiting your documentation. And of course, start early. The longer the runway is, the easier it is for you to, uh, to get the plane off the ground. And with that, we will open it up for just one or two questions, I believe, is all we have time for. Well, I first need to let people know that, unfortunately, no one won the airplane from you. No one won we the airplane. We do appreciate those who submitted their answers. But the, uh, that's actually a went. good thing because we can't afford to buy an airplane. Yeah, that's not really in the budget this year. So, <laughs> um, I want to let you know that everyone's contact information is on the screen. So, as Jeremy said, you can reach out directly um, to him or Dave or Sean to get answers. Uh, and this is another reminder that you will get uh, an email in the next two days with a copy, a link to the copy of the slides, the recorded webinar, and information about your uh, continuing education certification. So we really um, encourage you to complete the survey as you exit our webinar, and that will complete your, your requirements for CE. So thank you for joining us. Thank you, Jeremy, Dave, and Sean. Great job today. And uh, join us again for another webinar.